a friend of mine of Irish descent used to like to tell a story about an Irish Catholic priest preaching on his favorite subject, which was hell. And so he was going on and on about, it's a terrible place. The flames of hell, it's a fiery furnace, and the flames will never go out, and it's the place where sinful people are sent after they die. And there, there'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. So I'm warning you to turn from your sinful ways today, otherwise it's into the flames for you. And one of the town cynics, of which there were many in this community, an old guy, speaks up and says, What if you ain't got no teeth? And the priest, with this wicked grin, says, Teeth will be provided. <laughs> I love that story. It is, um, some people consider it their job to scare the hell out of others or to put the fear of God in others. That has been a task that some clergy have taken on with great and perverse pleasure, it seems to me. It also seems to me that the idea, the belief, that a loving God would take God's beloved children who have gone astray and barbecue them for eternity is truly a perverse belief. However, as we all know, fear <laughs> motivates. Fear sells. And all too often, unfortunately, it is the politician or the candidate or the leader or the leader-to-be who tells the scariest stories who's the one who wins. So <clears throat> is that what Jesus is doing with the parable today? Is he telling us a scary story? Or maybe telling the house of Israel a scary story, perhaps? He tells this story about a man who goes out and plants his field full of good seed. But later on, when the plants come up, weeds come up with them as well. And they wonder, well, where did that come from? And he says, well, it must have been the enemy when we were all asleep, when we were unconscious, when we weren't paying attention, when we we're walking around with our earbuds in, not uh, attending to the world around us at all. And the enemy came and so the weed seeds in there. Well, then master, the servants say, should we go and rip the weeds out so the field is clean? And he says, no, because you'll rip out the good with the bad. So let them be. And the Greek word is afete, which means allow or let be or forgive. That's another meaning of the word. Forgive them. Forgive this bad behavior for now. It will be sorted out in good time. There was at that time the belief that that great sorting out was very near, that the end was near, and that was, was sort of stirred and, and um, uh, energized by the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in about 69, 70 in that first century. So people had this intense sense that this world is coming apart. It can't last much longer. Well, <clears throat> if you read on in the text, which we're supposed to read today, um, I will read it to you. The parable is then explained and applied. Verses 36 through 43. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. And his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and evildoers. 
and they will throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. <clears throat> well, that takes the fun out of it, doesn't it? <laughs> like right now. And it also takes the parable and turns it into an allegory where every part of the parable then is explained and nailed down and all questions are sort of taken away and everything is, is clear. So you're not going to sit and discuss this question-wise and ask yourself about this because you know now what it means. You don't need to discuss it anymore. Do you think Jesus would do that? Do you think that's what he was about? Do you think that's the way he did things? I don't. I don't think so. Again, like last week, and this is my opinion, it's shared by some, but I think this is an editorial edition that comes later that maybe Matthew puts in or maybe a later editor puts in for another purpose. But that interpretation of the story has become the way to understand the story. It has become the dominant one. And with that belief that the great cosmic cleanup and sorting out is near, well, what the interpretation of the story and the story together say is, you better straighten out and fly right now and get your act together, or it's into the flames with you, where there'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. You can see how useful that teaching might be in a community where some people aren't quite behaving the way you need them to behave to hold the community together and to make it the community you want it to be. But the story itself doesn't talk about behavior. It just talks about seeds, right? Behavior can be changed. It can be adjusted. Seeds are seeds. You plant corn and you get corn. You don't get sunflowers. You don't change it after it's been put in the ground. It is what it is. And what sort of sorter are we dealing with here? Is this a loving one sorting things out? Is there redemption possible for what grows up out of this soil? Is there even any room for that? Some years ago, I saw this um, video series um, that Amy Jill Levine did uh, with a, a small sort of a classroom of people, and it was a series of New Testament stories. Now, Levine is Jewish. She's a biblical scholar, and she often focuses on New Testament stories and themes, seems to enjoy those particularly. So this was New Testament stories that she was digging into and sharing insights about it was wonderful stuff. At the end of one of the sessions, she would uh, uh, always she would take questions. And at this particular session's end, someone asked, so what do you do with that passage in John where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And Levine says, I have no problem with Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. I'm good with Jesus. Jesus is a Jew. I'm a Jew. I'm, I'm fine with Jesus. I like Jesus. We're good as far as I'm concerned. And if he's the one who decides who gets in and who doesn't, I am good with that. I have no problem whatsoever with that. Where I do have a problem, however, is with all those people who want to push him aside and take his place. And that has stuck with me vividly. Now, thankfully, I'm not one of those people, nor are you, right? We are not those people, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, what happened this week sort of puts us, in a way, in that place. Because our government this week, cold-bloodedly, with um, much planning, executed three people and you and I helped pay the bill. 
For 17 years, the Department of Justice has not carried out any executions of prisoners in federal prisons, even though they're on death row. Now, enlightened states like Texas and Mississippi and Alabama have continued on killing people willy-nilly, practically. But our own government stepped back from that in 2003. Well, now this year, this president and this attorney general decided it's time to start killing people again and doing it in quick fashion. That's why three were killed this week. Wesley Perkey, Dustin Honkin, and Daniel Lewis Lee died this week by lethal injection. The hands of the Department of Justice, Justice, and with our money helping pay for it. Now, these three were not nice people. They did bad, bad things. They were convicted of murder. And in the case of Daniel Lewis Lee, it was the murder of a family of three. Now, Lee committed this crime when he was 24 years old in 1996. The year before, when he was 23. Now, think about being 23, 24, especially as a guy. Brain research tells us your brain isn't even done until you're like 27 as a guy. You're still rattling around inside there. So this kid, this young man, was recruited by a guy named Chevy Heho, who was a white supremacist, white supremacist and ran a, a gang, led a gang of white supremacists. He um, recruited Lee to be part of his new Aryan People's Republic that was going to be formed in the Northwest part of the United States. It would be a nation within a nation, a reservation for white people only. <laughs> and in plotting this out, they got together and they went to Arkansas and they robbed a man named William Mueller, who was a gun dealer. And they stole a whole boatload of weapons and ammunition from him and $50,000 in cash to help their cause. And then in, in horrible fashion, they murdered him and his wife and their eight-year-old daughter. That was sick. Chevy Kehoe, the leader, is now serving um, a life prison sentence with no possibility for parole for this crime. He's got a history of violence and other crimes. Daniel Lewis Lee didn't get life. He got the death penalty. So, on Tuesday morning at 7.04, he died by the lethal injection. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life is how we understand justice in this becoming great again nation, apparently. After Lee's execution, Attorney General William Barr said, quote, Lee finally faced the justice he deserved. The American people have made the considered choice to permit capital punishment for the most egregious federal crimes, and justice was done today in implementing the sentence for Lee's horrific offenses. Earlier, Attorney General Barr had said that this was being done in part to give victim's family closure. However, the victim's family filed suit to stop the execution. They did not want Lee to be killed. They wanted him to serve life in prison, just like his partner in the crime. So it wasn't about them. And I would submit to you it's not about justice, because justice isn't served. It is, and it's not about punishment, because punishment teaches you something. And what do you learn from being killed? So we have weeded out, to put it in the language of the story, we have weeded out the products of three bad seeds in the field. Have we not? However, the parable says, Jesus says in the parable, what? Master, should we go and rip out the weeds now and clean up the field? And he says, no, let them be. The sorting out will happen. The cleanup will happen. That's not your job. That will be done in God's good time, in God's good way, in God's way. 
but we don't wait for that. So I, let me suggest um, another way that we might hear this story, another direction it might take us. What if the seeds that are planted in the field are not people, and the field is not necessarily the world? What if the seeds are ideas and questions and yearnings and longings and hopes and dreams, and you and I are the fields in which they are planted, in which they are scattered? What sort of things were planted in that child named Daniel Lewis Lee? What sort of experiences did he have that turned him into the kind of person that he became? I tried to find out more about him, and I couldn't find anything. It's like he didn't exist before he was recruited by Chevy Kehoe. There's a story there, and I would bet to you he went through some hellish things. What if, even though we can't control the things that are flung at us, as far as seeds, ideas, beliefs, whatever, we can't control that, and we can't necessarily always control what takes root in us, but we have this life we are given by God, in which we might learn to discern what it is inside of us that is feeding our action and our attitude, and whether that's good or bad, right or wrong. What if this COVID-19 time, this stay-at-home time, and the aftershocks of George Floyd's death and the deaths of all of these other black people at the hands of police, and the demonstrations and the riots and the protests and the demands for truth and justice finally for them and for all of us, what if all of that is us feeling the heat from that purifying fire that God is? During the riots on Lake Street, one of the business owners on Lake Street was watching his building burn. He was an immigrant. And there was a reporter there, just happened to be there and asked him about it, and he said, let it burn. If this is what it takes to bring about justice for George Floyd and people like him who have not had justice, ever in this country, then let it burn. So be it, if that's what it takes. It can be rebuilt. Should we tear out the weeds? No. Let them be. The sorting will happen in God's good time and God's goodness. Is it possible that that great cosmic clean up and the sorting out is happening right now within us and around us in all of this that we are experiencing. If so, then yes, it is warm in here. And no, it's not just me. We really are in this together, all of us, whether we like it or not. And as Jacob awoke to, God is in this place, in all of God's promise, in all of God's grace. Thank God.